that's the thing with violence, it's always an explosion. And then people lose their morale and then they run. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 390. And today, I'm joined by my guest, Sensei Casper Mockink. My name's Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on this show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick, and I'm just a guy who said, you know what? I really love traditional martial arts, so let's find a way to make it not only my life, but my career. And that's what we have here with Whistlekick. We do this show. We have a whole bunch of other projects, and you can check out everything we do at whistlekick.com. And if you use the code PODCAST15 while you're over there, you can save 15% on everything. You can also find quite a few of our items over on Amazon, and we even have some of these episodes transcribed as Kindle books and paperbacks, as inexpensively as Amazon will let us do them. Also, we can share them with you, with others, for maybe for people who prefer the written word rather than the podcast format. But of course, you can get a transcribed version of every episode at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Those are free. And we have 389 other great episodes, interviews, topics, advice, all kinds of stuff. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, photos, oh, you name it. There's just, there's stuff. Check it out. If you haven't been over there in a while, check it out. We recently updated a number of things, make some stuff easier to find. So let's talk about today's guest. One of the things I enjoy about martial arts is that it's universal. Even though there are localized differences in the way certain styles are taught, and some martial arts are more prominent in some parts of the world than others, it's still something you can find just about everywhere you go. And because of that, it's given me the opportunity to speak with people from all over the world. And here we have another international guest, someone who's listened to the show quite a bit and reached out. And we had a great email conversation. I said, yes, let's bring you on the show. It's time. Sensei Casper Mocking tells some wonderful stories, goes pretty deep, and I've got to say, he's a bit of a paradox with his approach, with his philosophy to his martial arts. I'm not going to ruin that, tell you exactly what I mean, but rather, I let him tell you. So here we go. Sensei Mocking, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hello, hello. Um, uh, <laughs> Jeremy, if you please would not call me Sensei. All right, all right. Well, title, but... I hate hate's, hate's pretty strong, and and <laughs> listeners are thinking that we just set this up, but we we didn't. This this is this is all organic. This is new to me. Tell me why you hate the word. <laughs> well, the thing is, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Dutch guy, just like I told you before when I filled in the form years. In Holland, we don't really use it. I'm from a Dutch kickboxing style, so that's a little bit different. It's a, it's a blend between uh, kyokushin karate, Thai boxing, and just regular kickboxing, and. We don't really use it. I only uh, talk to to my teacher like that, and I don't feel really co- qualified right. to call myself well, a hey, sensei. That's you know, a, we we have so much conversation on this show about titles and and their use and their, uh, you know, the detriment, the downside of using them. And you know, we're recording this yeah. uh, in early April. It'll be a couple of weeks before it comes out. But we just released last week an episode on a hierarchy on the martial arts, and it's. It, it's, I, I don't know, I, w- I won't yeah. say it's created controversy because I haven't heard anyone coming through disagreeing with it yet, but we've had a lot of feedback on it. The, the challenges of, of honoring our tradition and using titles and, and this specific language and yet trying to, to grow and move forward and be, be open and democratic. And it just, there, there are so many conflicting elements to it, isn't there? Yeah, yeah I, I think it kind of is. Uh, one, one of the right. things is, of course, you put somebody on a pedestal. Uh, I, I think that's a very dangerous thing to do sometimes. Not because they don't deserve it, but there's all, always an ego in, in people. And I think martial arts is about removing your own, yeah, yourself well, I've from always your own ego. I've always kind of in, enjoyed that, that, um, that idea of putting someone up on a pedestal because anyone that's ever had small children or taken care of small children knows what's the one reason you don't put them up on something high because the only place they have to go is to fall. When we lift people up, when we, <laughs> yeah, when, yeah, you know, there's a difference between <laughs> respect and honoring someone and then to put them above you. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, I think it's a really difficult topic because uh, I really, well, if I look at my sensei, I will say it to, to him, Us, sensei, but uh, normally we don't use it. 
But I really, really respect the guy. But still, it, I think it's a difficult, uh, difficult thing. We, we, just, we, just, yeah, we just don't use the title that much, I think. Interesting. Is that something... Because, of course, I, I've, I'm an American. I've traveled outside the U.S. I've never mm-hmm. been to Holland. But I don't know the, the culture, the martial arts culture of other places. And, and you probably have a better idea of American martial arts culture than I have of your martial arts culture. Yeah, Is that I think something so. that's yeah. common there? Uh, yeah, I think so. To push so. back on uh, the titles? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, in Holland, we're, we're uh, yeah, a little bit different than our uh, German neighbors or than the Belgian or the French. We are really, uh, f- uh, we have fought ourselves free. That's how our country arose. And we really hate authority. Mm. It's, it's not our thing, I suppose. Interesting. Okay. Well, that's kind of cool. It's interesting to me how martial arts changes even just a little bit everywhere that it goes because of course martial arts has to fit in to the local landscape and you have all these nuances of the culture of of wherever it is i mean martial arts in new england here where i where i am is very different than martial arts in california i shouldn't say very different but it is different it's a little different because people who live in california are different from people who live in vermont yeah yeah i believe that's so yeah all right. And I think that's good because uh, if there are different pools of people, the style will develop better because you will look at your way at the technique. I will look my way at the technique and if, not even at the technique, but also at the, at the principles and the philosophies behind the technique. Absolutely. And that's how you can create Dutch kickboxing. That's why you have a lot of Dutch guys who go to Thailand to, to fight Thai, uh, why you see a lot of Dutch trainers in the UFC, when you, when you see a lot of Dutch karate cars. Um, all right well in 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 your first few sentences you mentioned kickboxing you mentioned kyokushin you mentioned thai so let's let's go back you know ask ask the question that we ask everybody at the beginning (laughs) how did you first get into martial arts um i first started with my father when i was really small my uh, mother didn't like it really that much but uh we used to spar grapple and do some karate together um i was about six or seven i believe when, when we start with them so after like a year or two my mother was okay we're not going to do this you're going to fence so i see fencing also as a martial art because yeah it's it's maybe not a traditional martial art but you know you try to hit each other the respect is there a lot of things are the same um i did that for eight years or even longer i believe for 12 years Mm-hmm. And I became a, a fencing instructor also. Uh, and then when I was, I believe, let me see, 16, I started with Wing Chun. I did that for two years. I didn't really like it, but uh, I thought it was still cool to learn how to fight. Uh, after that, I had, uh, I had a big accident. Uh, I was paralyzed on my left side for, for over a year. And I needed to start all over again. So. Yeah, after about a year, I went with a friend of mine who did Pentrix Silat, the Indonesian fighting art. Uh, and I did that for about two years. And well, the Indonesian uh, Pentrix Silat we have in, in Holland, where I did, Satria Muda, is really uh, correlated to Thai boxing. So yeah, from one thing came the other. And after that, after that I became yeah, really into Thai boxing. And in Holland, uh, Dutch kickboxing and Thai boxing are pretty much the same it's only the rules that you're competing that's different and let me see that's how i get into kickboxing and thai boxing um i also did some krav maga uh when i started with thai boxing and also in the army i did krav maga with it uh yeah it was pretty cool but i i missed the system in it um when that was done let me see uh, i wanted to focus at kickboxing so i did that a lot of for like four years now, uh, extra. Uh, and then I did so, and I, and I also do some BJJ also extra, and do some uh, yeah, training with some M- MMA guys. So that's about it, I suppose. It's a really well. Th- I think that's story, about it because what else is there? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. You, I, I mean, <laughs> you've trained at least a, a bit in just about everything, and that's pretty impressive. But I kind of want to go back because you 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 said that your father introduced you to martial arts, but yeah. Where did he develop his knowledge or, or interest in martial arts? 
when he was small, well, when he was a little bit younger, I suppose he's about your age. <laughs> he's a, a, li a little bit older, I suppose, n but not that much. Uh, he was looking at Enter the Dragon from Bruce Lee. Mm. And lots of movie. <laughs> and that's how he started with karate and judo. Okay. And, and is he so, still yeah. practicing? No, 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 no. He stopped when he was, uh, I believe, 25 or something like that. But the, the passion was still there and he wanted to teach me that. Okay. So he thought it was very important for us to defend, us, okay. to defend ourselves. You, you, said, you said us. Do you have siblings? Yeah. Yeah, I have, uh, let me see. I have three, three brothers and one sister. Okay. All right. And he taught all so, of you, you know, some basics of judo and, and got you interested in martial arts. Um, no, only me. <laughs> oh, only? Okay. All right. Hold on. There's got to be a story there. Why only? Uh, well, I, I, I need to clarify one thing. Um, technically speaking, with, this, uh, with, with my father, I have only one brother. Okay. So the rest is from my other father. I see. So, so and my, my brother, so my one brother with, with, with this father, um, yeah, he just didn't like it at all. <laughs> okay. All right. I get it. I get it. So, so but, but because you asked me how much siblings I have, yeah, they're all, they're all my siblings. I don't, I don't see the difference. I them. understand. Yeah. No, I get it. I get it. Most of the time when someone comes on the show and they've bounced around and they've trained in a bunch of different martial arts, it, it usually means that they love martial arts, but they're still looking for something. There's something that's missing in their different training. And it sounds like you've settled on kickboxing. Is that, is that fair to say? Um, for a big, for the striking part, yes. Okay. What is it about kickboxing that clicks for you, that resonates for you in a way that, let's say, you mentioned Wing Chun. Yeah. Really like that as much. What is it about kickboxing versus, say, the Wing Chun you were training? Uh, the, the, the reality in it. Okay. So in kickboxing, if you get punched to the face, you get punched in the, fa in the, in the face. In, uh, in Holland, uh, in Dutch kickboxing, it's all, everything you do is full contact. No, you never stop. It, it just, it just, you know, just like Muay Thai, really. And I really love it. You, you, uh, when you're angry, you can put it there. Well, you, you don't fight angry, but I think you know what I mean. I do. Uh, and, uh, and also, it's the continuous development of yourself. I mean... If I do a punch, I never do it right. I mean, I've done punches for like, oh my God, for like a hundred and hundreds of hours. Maybe have like the left and then the straight, the right straight. And even now I'm still doing it wrong. And that's, I think, the thing I love about it the most. Mm. There's so much depth in the art and so much uh, reality in it that you need constantly need to evolve yourself. I love it. It's, mm. it's, it's great. Now I'm going to imagine. Yeah, I I don't know the population of of Holland, but I know it's not nearly as large as the U.S. And still, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> and still here in the U.S., most martial artists, most people who are fans of you brought up the UFC, know who Baz Rutten is. Who, of course, we had yeah. on the show not too long ago. Yeah, <laughs> he's Dutch. He's a kickboxer. Yeah, yeah. Kyokushin. You know, we're, we're, I'm seeing some similarities between you and him. Yeah. Is is he a bit of a role model for you? Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I really like his stuff. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> when when I was in the night security, I always used to look at uh, look at this technique and his matches in pride. I loved it. <laughs> and it, it, to me, it looks like a very nice guy too. Uh, very relaxed, very honest. Yeah. He yeah. was a great guy to have on the show. I I can't I can't, you know, say that I've met him, but you know, our conversation during the episode and then. Leading up to and after, was was I, I, was, I was pretty I was pretty jealous at you. <laughs> <laughs> I was almost jealous of me. It was a big deal to, to get him on the show. I was I was honored. I was honored. That's so cool. Yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty pretty crazy because um, like last year I, I worked a lot with Fedor Amenenko. I don't I don't know if you know him. It's uh, the guy who who won multiple times Bellator. Okay. Yeah, I know the name. 
Yeah, it, 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 well, it was like a few years ago, one of the best fighters I ever, ever lived. Just like Bas, to be fair. And he, he, he came to Holland, to my trainer, to train his kickboxing. I mean, yeah, that's, to me, that's so strange. I mean, we are such a small country, but like all the, um, all the, kick, all the people who wanted to learn to kickbox come to Holland. Back in the days of uh, Glory and K1, it was even so strange that like the, the Moroccan uh, Hollanders, like the, 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 the Dutch people who came from Morocco, the parents come from Morocco, needed to come out uh, for Morocco because otherwise all the kickboxers on, on K1 would be Dutch. <laughs> Why is that? What is it about kickboxing? <laughs> and they thought it wouldn't sell. What is it about kickboxing and the Dutch people? I don't know. I think we really love uh, uh, really basic stuff. Pragmatism. Okay. The simple, keep it real, and no boo and stuff. We don't like that. <laughs> no talk about chi or that kind of crap. I don't know. Really? Okay. All right. So, were you? How do I want to ask this? When you were, when you were growing up and you're training in these other arts, some of this less pragmatic stuff is is pretty fundamental in what we what we generally talk about as traditional martial arts. Yeah. Were you aware that that wasn't something that, that worked for you then? Or was it only after the kickboxing that you said, you know, I don't even want to worry about this other stuff, this extra stuff. Um, well, I always noted, noticed it. Like when you do in the uh, Pentex Silat, you have the, the Lankas and that's the, they're the same as Katas of forms only they call them different because it's in Indonesian art. So, <laughs> and I always kind of liked them, but I always felt like it was not real fighting. It doesn't have, uh, most of the time it doesn't have a real fighting application to, to it. And I don't, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to say that katas don't have a place because you learn stuff from it, but I don't think it's the most effective way to learn how to fight. I would agree. And I think most people would agree. Yeah. But I believe the problem is that in most schools, uh, they, they, they don't tell you that. Right. I, I will agree. Anybody who is, who is teaching kata forms and saying this is the best way to learn how to fight is wrong. But that doesn't yeah. mean that there aren't tremendous other... Benefits. Of, benefits. Yeah, of course. I'm, yeah. complete, I'm completely agreeing with that part because um, it's, just, it's, it's, it's culture. You're strengthening your body with it, I believe. Um, in some cases, most of the people I know from uh, Karate or from Penjak Silat have, have tremendous kick because they do the, the, the Lankas or the Katas with the, with the kicks and the forms. I, I think it's very important for that. And also for the... Uh, most kickboxers can't fight both sides. Mm. And most uh, people who do uh, Katas and Lankas, they can because they practice it. It's a great point. It's a very good point. Now, anybody that's spent a lot of time in kickboxing tends to have ended up in competition at some point. I'm guessing <laughs> you've competed. Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah, uh, like uh, let me see. When did he? Uh, like two, three weeks ago. Uh, three, three weeks ago. Three weeks ago. Life. Okay. <laughs> yeah. How are you feeling? Uh, uh, I, yeah, pretty good to be fair. I didn't have uh, any any damage done to me. I was very happy good. because uh, we we fight without uh, shin protection and stuff. Only gloves. And normally my shins are all banked up after, and I didn't have anything. So yeah, I was happy. <laughs> That's great. How many how many full contact fights have you had? Uh, in kickboxing, I believe seven, seven, six, 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 I believe. And then I also had a, a bunch of full contact bench axilot fights. So they don't punch to the head, but it's still full contact. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and also I also did some Kempo fighting, but I didn't really like it. We were justified to do that. And that's that's a pretty uh, pretty uh, funny story, to be fair. Okay. We were invited there. To, we were invited to fight at a Kempo uh, tournament. It was the the Dutch Championships, and it was for me my first tournament I I would fight in. So we came there and we started to compete and I hit the guy in the face, full force, boom. 
And then the referee stopped us from, okay, you cannot hit full force. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's point firing. I didn't know that. Nobody did, did, did told me that. <laughs> My trainer did told me it. So we were perplexed, like, oh, okay. So after all, so uh, we made some adjustments, uh, get a lot of warning for a little bit, yeah, the, the, for not pulling my punches enough. But all in all, I, uh, I became a Dutch, uh, a Dutch uh, national, national champion in Kempo. Ke <laughs> Even though but you I thought you were going into a full contact fight. Yeah. <laughs> 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 now, now I don't know if that says something really positive about you. Maybe it says something less positive about the people that we're fighting. Maybe both. But that's, that's uh, pretty funny. Yes, yeah, to me it was too. Uh, I, I, I never forget. I was there with my uh, with my best friend, and he, he gave me into martial arts, which in the into the pentaxilat and into the Thai boxing. And uh, this guy really kicks hard, really, really hard. It's it's amazing. This low kicks. And he was standing there, he kicked the guy in the shin with shin protectors on, and the other guy didn't want to fight him anymore. <laughs> Those low kicks. Those low kicks. Now I I can speak to low kicks because I've grown up in martial arts that don't use low kicks in in any of any of the rules. I grew up primarily doing point fighting. And yeah. I've I've trained with and actually just this past weekend was training with some folks who Spend a lot of time in, in Thai kickboxing. Uh, I, I'm thinking of crew. John Johnston was there this weekend. He's been on the show. And he and, and his guys, I mean, they're, they're used to, you know, throwing those leg kicks. And, and here we are, we're oh. sparring. And I'm sparring with this one person. And, and it's just, it, they just kept trying to take my legs out from under me. And, and I knew that if any one of those had connected, yeah. my shins aren't conditioned fun. for that. I'm not used to that. It hurts. <laughs> It's a different animal, right? <laughs> Very different. But it's such a practical movement at the same time because anybody can reach the shin. Anybody can kick yeah. anybody in the shin. Yeah. And, 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 and even if you took it a little bit, uh, a bit higher to, to the leg itself, oh, man, those things hurt. Uh, but I, I love them. My last match in my, in my first round, I make 26 low kicks in the first rounds only. Wow. So he had a match from two minutes. So that was the first round. I, I kicked the guy 26 times in his legs. And he was still standing. Well, that, that was the amazing part to me. But <laughs> <laughs> oh. it, it, it was a tough guy. and I, I needed to say that. <laughs> I, I guess. I guess. That, that sounds like, like a pretty tough guy. <laughs> now well, I, 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 Go ahead. So, so, so. I, think, I think it was a Russian. And most Russian guys are, oh, they're so tough always. <laughs> 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 now when when we were starting off and we started talking about you know titles and everything you mentioned you've mentioned a couple times your your karate instructor your Kyok kyokushin instructor so are you still training in kyokushin uh, well uh, officially I, well, it's a, it's a diff, uh, difficult story because in dutch we have blended them uh, at least in the kickboxing style we blended it all together uh, my, my, my trainer is peter peter tyson peter tyson and he is a, a world champion uh, Thai boxer, uh, a world champion Safat fighter, and just uh, and a Kyokushin fighter. Okay. So the guy is amazing. Uh, he he has so he has so much knowledge in in, in fighting systems. It, to me, stand up fighting is it's really amazing. And uh, sometimes we, we yeah we still train it like that, but most of the times uh, we just train kickboxing. Although I wanted to compete in, in Kyokushin uh, again because I kind of like it and my face don't uh, and I don't get that much hit, hit in the face, face in Kyokushin fights. Right, right. Hold and I like that too. <laughs> I, I also like not getting hit in the face. <laughs> <laughs> one, of, one of my personal preferences. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. I'm not getting punched in the face. It's, it's, it's one of the most important things about fighting, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> now, whenever we have people on who have trained in a bunch of different martial arts, they get exposed to a lot of different influences. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, when you, when you think back, when you, when you look at your own, uh, we'll say, personal style of martial arts, mm -hmm. who's been the biggest contributor? Who influenced your Life martial thing. arts the most? 
Ooh, like trainers, you mean, or? Yeah, trainers or coaches. But you know, to be honest, we've had people credit their their parents. You know, it could it could be anybody. What if you were to imagine who what what one person could we take out of your history and it would change you and your martial arts the most? There's another way. Um, Peter, the guy I trained for the last three years, for, for two and a half years, Peter, Peter Tyson. He's one of the most important uh, people. Who, he, he really learned how to move. Before this, I was just banging and standing with somebody. Uh, such, uh, what I say, such amazing skills, so, so much knowledge, knowledge. He's one of, yeah. Uh, really changed my game. Um, another guy, I can say, Fedor. Oh, such an amazing, amazing athlete I, I, I had to train with. It, it, it was amazing. The guy was so fat. He is a... Uh, uh, 120 kilos, I believe, in pounds, it is 250, something like that. Mm -hmm. Really heavy dude. And I'm like uh, 80 kilos, that's uh, 160, I believe. And I couldn't hit the guy. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Uh, but all basics, only basic, 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 basic. I trained for him with, for hours, only stepping, 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 stepping. And that's one of the most important things I, I took with me, I suppose. Wow. That being said, yeah. Um, also, my first kickboxing teacher, Jerry Morris, an amazing kickboxer, uh, also multiple world champion in Thai boxing, and, and also karate. Uh, amazing the, the the kicks, I love it. When I talk to martial artists, you know, like martial artists, like everyone else in the world, has challenges. We have things that we go through in life that are difficult. Sometimes those things are physical. You know, maybe, maybe someone attacks you. Sometimes, hopefully most of the time, it's not something that dramatic, but it could still be very intense, you know, something emotional or personal. But mar as martial artists, we have different tools. We have different experiences to face and overcome those challenges. Tell us about one of your challenges that you've been through and how martial arts made it easier. Um, yeah, for me, one of my biggest challenges was, like I told you, uh, when I was 16 or 17, uh, I had a, a stroke, or, or at least we, we thought so, and I was gone. I was, uh, yeah, like I was in a coma for, for, yeah, for some few minutes, and I, I believe a few hours. I, I'm not sure because I cannot remember it precisely. Um, and when I wake up, I was uh, paralyzed for four, four, 70 percent on my left side. And yeah, I believe that martial martial arts and sporting in in general helped me to get better. The doctor told me I would never walk again, nor or never run again. And I, I just thought, no, it's not going to happen. How old were you when this happened? Uh, uh, Sixteen or seventeen. Okay, and and do they know what caused it? Did did you say I? I... I missed if you said that. Yeah, yeah. The they, they suspect that in my family we all have uh, one bad uh, how do you call it? Uh, uh, one gene, bad, bad vessel. Yeah, oh, okay. if you, bad vessel. In, in our in our brain, mm -hmm. and it can break at any moment. Most of the times it breaks when we are a little bit older. And uh, with me, it break, uh, it broke when I was really young. So mm. I was kind of lucky in that one. Because when you're young, you uh, yeah, you can recover faster. Sure. So at at 16, you're you have a stroke and you and you're out and you come back and you're partially paralyzed and they tell you you're never going to walk again. What what does that feel like? I mean that uh, that, that has to be overwhelming. Yeah, yeah, it kind of was. Uh, I just started with a new ed education, and uh, I couldn't do anything. It was, it was, uh, it was bad. It was really bad. Yeah, but I was not going to accept it. It was not going to happen. And that was your attitude, <laughs> in, uh, yeah. from the beginning. As soon as soon as they told you that, you said, "No, forget that. I, I'm I'm going to walk again. I'm going to make full recovery." Yeah, pretty pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I, I believe it took two weeks, something like that, to 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 be really sure. Because uh, at first, the first two weeks, you're so uh, you're not really there. You're there, but you're not really there. I couldn't think that straight. Mm. And after that, I was okay. I'm going to recover, and I'm going to do it. 
and and I was in luck. There was a friend of my parents who was uh, yeah schooled into re recovery, and he took me in, and I could train for like five, six times a week with him, free. And that's how I recovered. And after a half a year, I started with uh, Penchak Silas. And after another half year, I become uh, the, the Dutch champion in camp in, in camp in Kempo. Within a year. Wow. And I uh, and I also within that same year, it was uh, I believe ex uh, I had it in the starting of October, and the next year, at the end of October, I did my first marathon. Are, are you someone who enjoys doing things that others say you can't do? Are you a rebel? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you a sound a bit rebellious to me. <laughs> yeah, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. That, that was also the whole uh, story how, how I started at uh, <laughs> at the at the marathon. I was running, and I, and uh, we have a very long uh, a dike. How do you call the, the how do you call it a dike? The the thing you put. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, well, we have a really big wall that puts uh, that makes sure no water comes into our, our, our country. A dam. A dam, yeah. In, in Thank you. Dam, yeah. A dam, yeah, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> and uh, and it was like 30 kilometers long. And, and I had something like, okay. And, I, and when I was little, I looked at it and I, I can run that far. I can make it. So I just did. And so when I was back, I was already in, uh, in, in army school back then. And I told my, my, my pals, like, hey, guys, like, look at what I did this weekend. They told me, no, you, you didn't do that. You're liars. Screw you. Or at least you cannot do that. And I told them, okay, listen to me. I will prove it to you. I will run the marathon in about two weeks. And they were laughing. And then I did it without any training or any special run training. We had a, a training mission the week before, the week before. So I, I, I come back at Friday and on Saturday I run, I, I run the marathon in three hours and 40 minutes. <laughs> okay. You, you are a special kind of crazy, my friend. That, that is, I, I've known other people who have run marathons without training, but they, they have not finished. So that's impressive. Uh, it did hurt. I need to be honest. It did hurt <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I wouldn't have believed you if you said that it hadn't. Uh, well, I was pretty happy because when I uh, get back to my to my military base, they were so proud of me that that I uh, that I didn't have to do any gym for the rest of the week. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> when you think of your time in the martial arts and not that what you just told us isn't an amazing story, but I'd love for you to tell us your favorite story involving your martial arts. And, and you've told some good ones. And, and if, if the ones you've already told us are your favorites, then, then just pick another one for us and, you know, tell, okay. tell us something new. Um, let me see. Well, it's, 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 it's maybe not my faith. Well, it's, 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 it's a good story. So I'm going to tell it. Okay. Um, let me, let me say before this, normally I, I hate violence. I don't like to fight at all, but it's a martial arts story. So nevertheless, I'm going to tell it. Um, like, let me see. We we're going out with some friends of mine. Like uh, most of my friends were in the army or, and pretty good kickboxers also, or Thai boxers or, uh, something like that. So we went out with a friend of mine, Rinaldo, the guy who kicked as hard that the guy didn't want to fight him at the Kempo uh, competition. Mm -hmm. And another friend of mine, Eric, who is uh, a ninjutsu expert and also a pretty good Thai boxer. And, 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 he, he, and he also was in the army. So pretty, pretty, pretty tough guy. And we went to Amsterdam. I live near Amsterdam when, when we go out at night, when we go a night out once, twice a year, we always go there. And we were sitting in the bus and uh, some guys, like 12 or 40 guys, were sitting in the bus, screaming, drinking beer, throwing bottles and, and just really being at, uh, yeah. And my friend of mine, the, the guy who was in the army, stood up and uh, told the guys to, to be quiet. Very nice, because that's the guy, kind of guy he is. And we have a little rubble and... Uh, and after that, we talked to him, okay, guys, just, just be quiet. Uh, we don't want anything to happen. Just come on, behave. 
and then they were uh, picking out of the and then they were trying to rip loose the the sittings in the in the bus and the the bus driver was not saying anything so we were really annoyed so at some point we told him again hey guys be normal just behave please come on and they, and they were quiet after that so we went out to the bus and at the moment we went out 12 or 30 guys also get out of the bu uh, bus and and come at us to 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 yeah, to get a story out of us why did we talk to them like that and normally i'm kind of a nice guy but i'm not really good in handling when somebody touches me really good i i just don't like that just don't do that and the guy pushes me and so i headbutted him and at that moment like 12 of those guys just went into a rage and it was one big fight but those other friends of mine also uh, just sprang straight into it. And so after about 10 seconds of hitting people, uh, I have need somebody, somebody else punched somebody else in the face. I, it, it was complete chaos. You heard them screaming, oh my God, they're boxers. They're boxers. You need to get the hell out of here. And which I believe after five seconds, everybody was gone. And we were standing like, what the hell did just happen here? <laughs> Wow, and and at the meanwhile, and at the meanwhile, my girlfriend was was standing a little bit behind her. He was like, "Oh my God, guys, I hate you." But at the at the end of all, everything, everybody was safe. No, nothing happened, so we were really happy. Good. But yeah, I think that was one of our better stories. It, it was so, so so strange. What I like about that story is that it starts off very much like it would be in a movie. Right. You, you can see that as a scene in a movie. But of course, yeah. the reality of violence is so different than what we see in entertainment. You know, if it, if it, it had been a movie, that would have been a three minute fight. We yeah, would, it is. Everybody yeah. would have been getting thrown around and 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 it, it just it would have been much more dramatic than what it was. Yeah. yeah. It, that, that, that's the thing with violence. It's always an explosion. It's an explosion, and then people lose their morale, and then they run. It's what always happens. You, you don't have to win. You don't have to uh, put the other guy out. You need to break his morale. And that's how you fight. That's how you uh, how you do war on somebody. Because you don't want them to fight. You want them to run. Right. Now, you mentioned, I think it was before we started the episode, that you spent some time as a bouncer. Yeah, I did, yeah. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about about that and how your time, you know, in this this very real, sometimes violent environment, changed your ideas or formed your ideas on what violence really is. Well, uh, first first of the things I want to, uh, want want to tell you about is that uh, talking with people and this, it's funny because the last episode I was listening, uh, the guy has also said it. Talking is the most important part of being into violence. Uh, I always thought when, when I make a joke, I mean to talk jitsu. Just talk with the guy. Be patient, listen, and try to figure this out without using violence. Because violence, oh my god, it, it only can uh, end bad. Because if I hit a guy, I probably go, go to jail. If I throw the guy on the ground, maybe he breaks his arm, then I also go to, to, to jail. When I don't do anything, maybe he will punch me in the face. So I think talking to somebody is so important. The other thing is uh, when it does happen, it's fast. And you need to be vicious. And what I meant about do your best technique, or I mean, just do what you think is right and do it as hard as you can because you need to, to make them quit. Hmm. A, a lot of that sounds like it could have come out of a Krav Maga class. Yeah. You know, that, that philosophy I, 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 that that be very brutal, very quickly, you know, don't don't wait, don't hesitate. That that's uh, now admittedly, I've spent very little time training in Krav Maga, but I've worked with a number of people who have. Yeah. And that seems to be the common theme. Yeah, well, it's 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 a soldier. Uh, it's the way of the soldier. How you uh, how you, uh, how do you call it? approach something. You need to attack it. The thing is, if you if you don't attack with full force, some other guys are going to look at you, and maybe it's friends or maybe some other people. Like, 
oh, that's okay. No, you want him to see that he gets a knee in the face, elbow in the snout, and the other guy will think, okay, I'm not going to... I'm, I'm not going to interact with this guy. I'm going to leave because that's what you want. Yeah. I mean, uh, and I, I think keep going. that's so important. If, 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 if you don't, if you need to pull the trigger, you need to pull the trigger. And you need to wait as long as you can, as long as you want to talk, 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 talk. But if, if it's real violence and somebody's really trying to hurt you, you need to feed the guy up. <laughs> That's okay. And and the beauty of it is that the listeners know what word you used, even though <laughs> even though we bleeped it out. So it lets us keep our rating yeah, on iTunes. Yeah, yeah, sorry. The no, thing is normally no. I don't swear at all, but you got you got worked up. It's you got emotional. It's okay. I'm gonna, <laughs> and I'm gonna the, take the other that, thing is that also that. Uh, when you look at bouncing, you have a lot a, a lot of fake violence. Like uh, you have like uh, somebody tries to <laughs> to really injure you, and you also have some guys who are just drunk. And when a guy is drunk, you don't have to hurt him at all. Right. When I try to remove somebody, yeah, you just can. Uh, if you just grab them by the neck or grab them by the arm from behind, they, they, they cannot defend themselves. You don't have to hurt them. Just be relaxed. Take them outside. But at the moment the guy really wants to hurt you, that's a different story. That's predatorial. Uh, then it's a predator. It's different. You've had a lot of pretty amazing experiences. And if you could add one by training with anyone, anyone in the world, any will even say anywhere in time they, they could they could be dead. If you could train with anybody, who would you want to train with? Well that one is pretty easy to be fair. Yeah. Bruce Lee. Okay. Yeah. The most common <laughs> answer. Uh, but what yeah, why? <laughs> why why Bruce Lee? It's the first time that, that you've mentioned him. Actually no, you, you mentioned you mentioned Enter the Dragon yeah. earlier. Well why Bruce Lee? Yeah. Uh well I and not necessarily because of his uh, fighting skills. Uh, I believe he was an amazing fighter, but I don't believe he was any more amazing than the fighters I have already trained with. To be fair. Yeah, just, may, maybe a little bit blunt, but but I want to pick his mind about philosophy. Mm. I I really think that's the most important part about him. And and what what sort of conversation would you would you hope to have? You know what when you talk about philosophy and martial arts, you know, tell tell me more. Where where would you hope that conversation went? Well, the, the different ways to the, the different ways to be when you're in fighting in mushy mind without mind. Um, how how can develop yourself better, but also how to be in balance with your inner self, and I mean that in the the Nietzschean way with the with the dark part of yourself. And with the light part of yourself. And I think we have, uh, nowadays in our society, um, a very big problem. The only thing we want to talk about is our light side. We don't want, want to talk about the predator that's inside of us. And I would love to spar with him about th those things. Mm. Mm. I would love to talk about the abyss with him. Yeah. Yeah. To, it, I'm going to guess that you've spent some time contemplating that the you called it the predator. You know, some people call it the, the dark side, the shadow side of our personality. Yeah. How does that relate to your perspective, your philosophy of martial arts? I think it's uh, one of it's it's one of the things you can train with martial arts. You can put it to good use. It's um, it's like the yin and yang. It's it's not all good and not all bad for, for definition. It's both a part of you and you need to integrate it into the in your own person. And the only way to do it is to, is to get in touch with it. And I believe sometimes when, when I'm, I'm having a match or something like that, I get really close to that animal that's inside of me. And I think that's very important to understand yourself better. Because uh, the person who says you cannot kill somebody are usually the most dangerous of all. The person who knows he can kill somebody but doesn't do it, that, that's a good person. There's a difference there. Mm. Mm. I'm going to have to think on that. That's interesting. I, hadn't, I haven't heard that before. And I'm, I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not disagreeing. 
but I need to digest that a little bit. I like it. Yeah. In in the uh, in the Old Testament, there is a, a a little bit. It's about uh, the people who have swords and don't use it and don't use it are good people. And in most translation, it's translated differently. Differently, it's translated like the the weak shall inherit the world. Maybe you know that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you uh, translate it uh, from, I believe, uh, Jew Jewish. It translated a little bit differently. It translated as people who have swords and know how to use them, but don't use them, will inherit the world. Mm. And where the idea is, um, if you know how to be violent, but you're not, if, if you can be it, but you don't act on it, then you're good and you will inherit the world. Because then somebody cannot mess with you. And otherwise, you are only weak. Yeah. And not necessarily good. No, and that's certainly an idea that comes up a lot in martial arts conversation. The idea that, and and I've heard some express it as to have the ability to defend yourself, the ability to protect someone else, and the choice to not use that skill is much more valuable than not having the choice at all. Yeah, yeah. Because if you don't have the choice at all, you're just not doing it because you can't. And th- that's that. Yeah. And maybe you should sometimes, because if somebody is pushing you, you need to be able to push back. Now you've mentioned Bruce Lee. You mentioned Enter the Dragon, and I'm I'm gonna guess that you're a fan of martial arts movies. There's just some, and it's not even those two comments. It's just something something about you tells me. You like a good fight scene, am I right? Oh yeah, 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 I do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what are I'm, you? I'm on a mission. Oh, yeah, Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm on a mission to uh, to let my girlfriend watch them all. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> really... That's all. <laughs> like all the. Yeah, yeah, I know, but at least from Bruce Lee and like the Yip Man series and just like the basic stuff. <laughs> now, what's your favorite? Do you have a favorite martial arts movie? Um. Well, Enter the Dragon is uh, one of my favorites. I believe uh, Fist of Legend is the one that he goes to the karate school, right? Uh, because all those names always change. It depends on which dub you have in yes. Holland. Yeah, and, and, uh, I, and I think you're right. I'll, I'll admit, some of the, the movies from that time period get a little blurry for me. I haven't watched them as, as many times as I'm sure listeners think I have. <laughs> well, I, I need to be fair. I believe Fist of Legend was one, when, when I was small was one of my favorite uh, movies, and and I'm also going to say The Last Samurai. Mm. I really dig that movie. <laughs> it's good... Maybe maybe it's it's part of it because I still hope to learn how to uh, how to fight with a sword better. But <laughs> I think that's the one one of the few martial arts disciplines you haven't trained in is something with a sword. <laughs> uh, fencing. Oh no! You said, I, 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 oh, I, I, see, I'm wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but but not with a katana, so <laughs> right. And and I would still lo- lo- love to learn it. I, I really would, or, or something like a screamer or something like that. Oh, I think it would be so great. Let's look into the future now. When you. When you look out over the next however many years, I, I assume you want to keep training. I don't think we've had anybody on the show in four years who said, <laughs> I'm just going to stop. So I'm imagining that you're not going to be the first person to say, oh, I'm just going to stop in like eight years. No, so, no, no. That's the thing. That's for sure. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so when you look uh, into the future and you're training, what are your goals? Uh, am I training specifically? Learn more weapon, weapon stuff. I, re- I really kind of dig it. I think it's cool. Um, I would love to get a black belt in uh, Taekwondo and the Kyokushin, just for the tradition of it. And I really love to kick, so I want to learn how to kick better. That's why I, I choose Taekwondo. And Kyokushin, I would love to do it just because the, the attitude in it. Love it. So I think that's, that, that's, that's, for me, that's the most important thing I want to do. And I'll say I keep competing. And maybe some MMA matches in the future. Okay. Right on. Well, I'll make sure I keep an eye out for your name. <laughs> well, I, I, I need to be fair in that. Uh, 
I, I love competing, but I don't think it's the most important part of, 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 of a fighting sport. Uh, competing for me is just to touch, uh, to test the theories I know about fighting. Mm. Because I, I'm a teacher, fundamentally. I love to teach. I think I love that more than fighting itself. But I don't want to teach my uh, children and, and the people I uh, teach uh, the wrong stuff. Makes sense. Again. So, 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 so for me, that's why I want to learn. Uh, that's for me. That's why I want to fight sometimes, and also sometimes you need to do something crazy, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to lie about that. And some, yeah, sometimes you just need the adrenaline, I suppose. <laughs> I understand. I know exactly what you're saying. You know, people want to find you online. They want to reach out to you, learn more about you, or or wherever. Where would they go? You know, social media, website, stuff like that. Uh, of social media, you can uh, search me up with Casper Mocking. So it's my personal uh, Facebook page. Uh, otherwise, you can look at Back to Base. And that's with a two in the middle of it. That's my school. And otherwise, yeah, in Instagram, it's the same. Back, back to Base is the, is the Instagram of my, of, my, of my dojo. And also, if you look at just Casper Mocking, uh, you can also find my Instagram and there I also also talk and show movies about fighting and stuff. So yeah, that's about it. And also another another way is my, my website. Right. And that is back to base uh, .nl. Well, of course, we're going to have links to everything that you just mentioned at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com so if people want to want to check out what you've got and you know, they don't they don't have a pen or or maybe your 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 accent's throwing them off a little bit. I mean, your English is amazing, but uh, yeah, I know. So, understanding so, uh, a website's hard enough as is, <laughs> and there's no difference in accent. <laughs> yeah, I know it's, it's it's horrible, and especially when I say it like uh, when, when I say it, I say it in Dutch. That's the whole problem, I believe. <laughs> well, I I will not say your English is horrible because you are more understandable than some of the folks that we've had on who are native English speakers. Uh, I, I'm not going to name any names. Got <laughs> a few folks out of the south that uh, I got some listener feedback that that they had a hard time understanding. So I, I've had an easy, fine time understanding you. You've done great. I, well, in, in in Holland, we learn uh, how to speak English when we are four, something like that. Our uh, one of our main uh, languages at home was English when we were discussing things, wow. because my little brother uh, went to an English school. So when we're talking about science and philosophy and politics, uh, he could talk better English than he could talk Dutch. So we all just spoke English to him. That's really neat. It, it, it's fascinating to me. And I, I, I guess I just feel lucky that I speak English. And at the same yeah, time, yeah, you're sure. a little sad that, you know, the, the, the language I speak, the next best is Spanish. And it, it barely compares I, I could never appear on a spanish speaking podcast and say anything beyond what you know a two-year-old would say well I, i'm uh, well i'm self i'm very dyslectic so the thing is i speak english no problem but i but i cannot write it at all hmm. so my, my little brother helped me with the with the emails we, we needed to, to send you oh because I, I i cannot write it at all but in, normally in, in Holland, it's, uh, it's normal for, 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 for a boy to speak English, German, French, Dutch, and sometimes Spanish. <laughs> and do you speak and, all of those? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I speak a little bit. I can understand German because it looks a lot like, like Dutch. But uh, no. Well, like I said, I was pretty dyslexic when I was at school. It was not a fun time. And my teacher, well, after one month, okay, you're not going to learn this. So just quit it. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I believe that. I believe that. Yeah, I've had a lot of fun talking today. And I appreciate your time. It's obviously, folks, there's a time zone difference going on here. And you were gracious enough to, to speak to me a little bit later in your day. And, and you know, we, we mentioned before we came on and started recording that, you know, you gave up on, on one of your personal commitments to come and do the show. And I really appreciate that. But if I could ask you for one more thing for all the folks listening, what parting advice, what words of wisdom would you share with the listeners today? Ooh, um, well, to be fair, just be yourself. 
just go out and be yourself and try to experience new things. Everything you think you can do, you can do way more than that. I would say when you think you're done, you're not only on 40, you're not even on 40% of yourself. You can go way beyond. I think that's the most important thing. Just go out and try it. We've had quite a few people on the show who have transitioned from, quote unquote, the more traditional martial arts into something maybe a little more reality based or realistic or whatever you choose to call it. And Sensei Mankink is one of those people. Yet throughout the conversation, he spoke affectionately for the philosophy, for the teachings of other, again, more traditional martial arts. And that was something I really appreciated. The martial arts is something that becomes inherently unique, and our perspective on that tends to show through when we talk about it. And that's what I loved most about this episode is that we got to see that. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for your time, and I'm sure we'll talk again soon. If you want to check out the links to the social media accounts and the websites that we referenced today, as well as check out a number of photos, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Again, this is episode 390, and check all of that out there. Don't forget, the podcast 15 discount code saves you 15% on everything that we sell at whistlekick.com. Sparring gear, apparel, sneakers, uniforms, tons of stuff. Check it out. Help support the show, whether that be through a purchase there or simply sharing this or another episode, leaving us a review. Anything you can do helps and is greatly, greatly appreciated. Find us on social media. We are at Whistlekick on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And of course, you can email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.